Well, good morning. Welcome to church on this Sunday morning. My name is Jake. If you didn't know, I'm the chairman here at the church and wanted to touch base with you on some information. I'm going to ask Chad Stuckey, our lead elder, to join me up here as we had some things to share with you. If you recall, over the past few weeks, uh, past month or so, uh, we've established a couple committees to take a look, to review, and make some recommendations. The first is our financial review, taking a look at our finances and uh, changing things as we need in preparation for the new pastor. The second would be our leadership organization, a committee established to look at that to streamline our leadership here at the church. And I'd like to tell you that over the past several weeks, both of those committees have been diligently working and uh, researching and meeting and they will begin to make recommendations to our board starting probably this Tuesday at our monthly board meeting. So just like to ask you to continue to be in prayer. I'm a little anxious because those recommendations will mean change. Some of those changes might be hard, but at the same time, I'm excited. We're, I'm encouraged. We're going in a positive direction, preparing the way for the new pastor. Um, and I tell you too, along the way, we're gearing up for growth in our church in that process. So continue to pray, and I appreciate all of you that have contacted us and me and just said that you've been praying for the church on a regular basis. Basis That's huge, and uh, please continue to do so. And we've all been waiting anxiously to hear about the pastoral search, and so Chad has some news for us there. All right, good morning, church. How are you guys doing today? It's exciting to be up here and give you some good news that we've officially kicked off the pastor search this week. So I want to make sure that we kept you guys in the loop. I've got a couple of notes I want to share with you because that's part of our commitment is to keep communicating through this process. So as Jake mentioned, we're doing some housekeeping for the last two months, eight weeks or so. This week we kicked off the search. Um, it's interesting, as we've been prep prepping for the pastor search, people have kind of come up to us and have shared their opinions and some input regarding the new pastor, new candidate. One of the themes that keeps coming up is the desire to find somebody more connected to our church. I don't know if that's literally meaning somebody inside the church, but someone who really gets Woodburn, um, in addition to great preaching and good spiritual insight, but someone who's a little bit more connected to the, the personality of our church. So that said, we're, we're not going to be using a search firm, a headhunting firm this year. We're going to try to keep the search inside, uh, probably board-led, as we start um, checking out candidates. There's a couple of things um, in terms of next steps. We started gathering names. Um, we've actually had one candidate submit their, their resume and name this week. The board is gathering more candidates that we know of. We're working with Ken Snyder at the Missionary Church to start networking within the denomination for folks that may be available to be, become a candidate. And then also an, an advantage that we never realized we had was Pastor Bill. Um, we talked to Pastor Bill this week. He is actually reaching out. He's involved. I don't, what's, what's the name of his ministry? Do you remember? I can't remember. He's, he's very involved with other pastors, and so he's got a really deep and extensive network. He's going to be reaching out personally to a lot of people he thought thinks that may be a good fit for us, too. So those are the three initiatives we've got going right now as we gather names. Feel free. If you guys have suggestions or somebody comes to mind, somebody the Lord's putting on your heart, find Jake or myself, somebody on the board, and share that name with, with us. Um, you may be asking, what can I do now? What, what's my, what can I do as I sit out there? Well, the obvious thing is, is pray. Um, the board, the elders have been committed to prayer the last eight weeks, really making that the top priority as we begin this search, and I would challenge you guys to do the same thing. Along with that, we're going to try to find some opportunities for some corporate prayer. Um, we've got a couple of big fellowship events planned for the congregation to bring us all together, but we're also going to plan some times where we can get together and just pray together, pray collectively for whoever the, the Lord's got for us. The last thing for you is if um, you've got concerns or questions or input, just ask us. Uh, we don't want this to become something where it, you're assuming or filling in the gaps or, or even just questioning what's happening behind the scenes. We'll tell you. So find us or a board member if you've got anything that comes to mind, and we'll, we'll do our best to try to be up here as much as we can to, to fill you guys in on what's happening. Absolutely. As information comes available, we'll come forward with that. Also, we have an email set up. That's leadership at woodburnmc.org. Leadership at woodburnmc.org. Feel free to drop us a line on that. We check that every week. So 
I'll be glad to get back to you on that. So now is the time to be on bended knee for your church. We're seeking the Lord's direction and pray that you'll seek that direction with us. So thank you. Church, uh, good morning to all our Pixel partners who are online. Uh, we're glad that you're with us, all the people from home. I guess we could call them our homies. Um, glad you've joined in with us. A couple of uh, exciting announcements of things that have happened in the church. This week, uh, we had uh, 50 preschoolers for VBS that happen happened here. Really exciting time. Yeah, that's great. So. Good week. We really want to thank all the people that it took to do that, all the volunteers and staff that joined in to do that. So thank you very much for your time and in investing in our children. So awesome time. Uh, this Saturday, this coming Saturday, is a Ponda River golf event uh, for men and women. It'll start at 7 o'clock or 7.30 uh, on Saturday. It's $35 a person. Uh, there'll be lunch and uh, golf cart and prizes and so forth. See Taylor Swymiller. He's the real handsome kid that's out hanging out at the, my son. He'll be hanging out at the Welcome Center. You can check in with him if you want to sign up for that. You can sign up as a team of four or you can sign up as an individual uh, for that this coming Saturday. So uh, you can sign up for that, I believe, all the way through Wednesday of this week. So if you're not prepared this morning, just call the church and they'll hook you up with that. Uh, July 4th. We'll be doing our service. Instead of in here, we'll be doing it in the park. So we're super excited about that. So if you're not going somewhere for July 4th, we'd love to have you come out uh, downtown. Bring a lawn chair. There will be a free lunch afterwards, and so we'll hang out for a good time of just being together, a good time of fellowship. So looking forward to that. Um, another announcement, Chad Wood's father, we just learned that he passed away um, this past week, and uh, so he and Beth, if you don't know Chad, Chad's the guy that plays acoustic guitar in second service normally when he's up here, uh, so he and his wife have gone down there, be in prayer for Chad and his family uh, at the passing of his father. So, Paul Harvey, and now for page two. Have you ever been in a place where you thought, it's good for us to be here? Maybe that's a family vacation, or maybe uh, you were just hanging out with your family at home, or maybe you were sitting watching a sunset or a sunrise, or maybe you're sitting on your John Deere quad drive super 10,000 horsepower tractor, something like that. God gave me that this week and thought about this idea of being, a, it is good for us. In Lamentations 3, 26 and 27, it says, The Lord is good to those whose hope is in him, to the one who seeks him. It is good to wait quietly on the Lord. Maybe you're waiting on the Lord. It's, it's good to wait quietly in the Lord. Psalm 73, 28 says, But as for me, it is good to be near God. Psalm 85, 12, The Lord will indeed give us what is good, and our land will yield its harvest. It reminded me of the story in Matthew 17, 4. If you remember, Jesus is with um, James and John and Peter. And he takes them up, it says, to a high mountain. And when they got to the top of this mountain, Jesus started glowing. It says that his face was like the sun and his clothes became as white as light. And then Mo Moses and Elijah appeared with him as he's standing on this mountain. And Peter <laughs> has this moment where he's so excited and he doesn't know what to do, but he's so moved by this time he wants to do something. And he says, Lord, it is good for us to be here. I'll put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Have you ever had a moment where you've been in such a place that you were just moved to want to do something? One time for me that happened in Cyprus. And if you've ever seen Cyprus, the island is big and then it focuses off to a very skinny point on one side of it. And uh, when we, I took a group of students to Cyprus and uh, when we went to a point way out on the end of this thing and we were standing up on a cliff and we're surrounded by about 270 degrees of bright blue water. Anywhere you looked, you saw the ocean up on an elevated thing. And I was so moved by that that I couldn't help but sing how great thou art. And so the students and the missionaries and I joined hands and sang how great thou art on the top of this mountain surrounded by Cypriot and Turkish people. One of the most meaningful times in my life. It's good for us to be here this morning. It is. It's good for us to be with our brothers and sisters in a place in God's house this morning. 
I'm hoping that you feel the same way I do, and I'm moved to want to do something. Psalm 92.1 says, It is good to praise the Lord and make music to your name, O Most High, to proclaim your love in the morning and your faithfulness at night. That's what this is about, our worship time now. Will you be moved with me this morning as we stand and we sing to Almighty God? It's time for the sleeper to wake. It's time for the old winds to change. Oh, I hear the Spirit say, it's time.
It's time for the dead man to rise. It's time for the green light to shine. Oh, I hear the Spirit say it's time. The fleeing wide heavenly gates. Let the King of glory, let the King of glory come riding. On your people's graves, let the King of glory, let the King of glory. It's time for the sleeper to wake. It's time for the old winds to take. It's time for the dead man to rise. It's time for the gray light to shine. Oh, I hear the Spirit say it's time. Sing Let the King of glory in, let the King of glory in, come riding on your people's graves. Let the King of glory in, let the King of glory in. Open up the windows, let the light in. Open up the windows, let the light in. Open up the windows, let the light in. Let the light in. Let the light in. Open up the windows, let the light in. Open up the windows, let the light in. Open up the windows, let the light in. Let the light in. Open up the windows. Let the night in, open up the windows. Let the night in, open up the windows. Let the night in, let the night in, let the night in, open up the windows. Let the night in, open up the windows. Let the night in, open up the windows. Let the night in, let the night in. Let the King of glory in, let the King of glory in, come riding on your people's graves. Let the King of glory in, let the King of glory in. And open up the windows. Let the light in, open up the windows. Let the light in, open up the windows. Let the light in, let the light in, let the light in, open up the windows. Let the light in, open up the windows. Let the light in, open up the windows. Let the light in, let the light in. King of glory, let the King of glory come riding on your people's graves. Let the King of glory, let the King of glory.
trust is without borders. Let me walk upon the waters wherever you would call me. Take me deeper than my feet could ever wander. Then my faith will be made stronger in the presence of my Savior. Thank you for being our cornerstone, that rock that we can rely on, no matter the storm that we that comes our way, God. That we can just we can always come back to you and know that you are our cornerstone, God. It is in you and you and you. God, I pray that not only that you corners you are our cornerstone, but God, that you lead us through your Spirit, no matter what's coming. God, I pray that you just encourage us in ways that we can't even imagine. God, I just pray that you speak to us in ways we can't even, we can't even fathom. God, we, just, we just praise you. Again, we thank you for being our cornerstone. In the name of Jesus. Good morning. I'm Mary Ann, and I serve as a member of the Missions Committee, and I am honored to introduce Stephen Sheila Harrigan to Woodburn again this morning. Um, the Harrigans... <laughs> the Harrigans are our world partners, missionaries to Sierra Leone, and more recently to the peoples of the nations who call Fort Wayne and Allen County their home. Mm -hmm. So we are so happy to have you here today and thank you for joining us this morning. It's good to be with you today. Can you hear me okay? Try to project. I came prepared, brought my mask. <laughs> a year and a half ago, I would have never thought of that. And this has been for a bandit when he's going to enter and rob the store. A white one is for a doctor, but now we all wear them, don't we? Have you had a lot of changes in your church, in your life, last year? Everybody has. You know what the church is like. What about missionaries? What about these people that are across around the world that are supposed to be meeting unbelievers and bringing Jesus to them? What's happening there? Is God doing anything? These are the kind of thoughts that maybe you're processing now. A lot of churches are starting to open up. We're kind of like Groundhog's Day. Everybody's peeking out to see what the weather's like, and then we come back in. And then if it's good, we stay out, right? And so we're all happy. I think we are happy that we're out here in church and able to move around a little bit and have a little more freedom. 
Are you awake? A nod is good, okay? You don't have to clap all the time, but just nod and give me some feedback, okay? I'm thankful that we're out and about. And you know, when we shut down for about a, a month, I begin to like look inwardly and say, what is God doing? And did you drop the ball, God? Did you fall asleep? You know, you're holding COVID back and then you kind of dropped. And you know how you do when you're, you're holding a pen or something and then you fall asleep and it drops on the... Ever have that happen in school or out of school or at the office? God didn't fall asleep. Now, some of you are maybe because of our age, and I'm in, getting in that era now, that you become a place where I need to be protecting. I need to be careful. But then there's a whole other generation of young people that God began to call out. And we have been, after a year, I said, you know, Lord, I know you're always moving counterculture because our culture kind of keeps us from really engaging sometimes in what you want to do. So when you're moving, it's not always where everything else is moving. So when I see the world moving this way, then I say, well, maybe, Lord, you're moving this way. And I believe God has been moving this last year with the young generation, and I don't know what you want to call yourself, but that were said, you know what, we want to do something. We want to see what God is doing, and we're tired of sitting around, and they didn't wait a year. They were like a month into this and said, we are done with this COVID. And the rest of us are saying, well, you should stay indoors. This is a serious problem. It's been a problem. But do you think God moves in the midst of problems? I think it's possible that maybe the Holy Spirit can take a bad situation and in the midst of that, something good comes out of it? Well, I want to share today with my wife what God has been doing in Fort Wayne in the midst of all this. And it is so exciting because, see, we've been praying for years. We worked with immigrants and refugees. We used to be in Africa. I used to be at this church, actually, in college a long, time, long, long time ago. Tammy was in my sixth grade junior church. It tells you how long ago it was. And we used to work in Africa as missionaries. I grew up in the missionary family. I was on the mission field, right? And I began to say, well, God, what are you doing here? And we've been working with immigrants and refugees because the world has brought the world, God has brought the world to our backyard in the last, oh, probably 10, 15 years. But is God doing something even more through this time and through this season? Because nobody's traveling. I don't know about you all, but you probably didn't do a lot of mission trips over to Cyprus and, you know, that beautiful sea that you saw. And it didn't happen this year, right? It didn't happen for a lot of places. So what is God doing here? So, you know, in the process of seeing what God is doing, you had some really neat songs, but you know what? In those songs, you were sharing some of the truths. If you want to know what God is doing, you have to become like a child. How many of you had children? I have discovered that children and grandchildren are the smartest creatures on the face of the earth. If you have a broken cell phone, who do you go to? If you have to hack into your computer, who do you go to? The 12-year-old. If you can't figure out how to set your watch, your iPhone, you call your kid, right? God wired children to learn languages. Five-year-olds learn languages like this, and we're still struggling at our age. Why? Because children are focused. They're, they're like, they're like a, a sponge sucking up truth, sucking up information. When Jesus said, what's that verse? Let the little children come to me, and King James, and forbid them not. For such is the kingdom of heaven. What was he talking about? Sometimes we say, well, it's come as a child, have faith as a child. That's true. I believe Jesus was saying, I want you to be so engaged with what I'm doing, so quick to learn, so in listening to my spirit, that you come like a child. He said that in three different places. In Mark 10, 14, Matthew 9, 14, and Luke 8, 16. Three times in the Bible, come as a child, Learn as a child so that what? The kingdom of God will be engaging constantly in your life. If we stop doing that, we stop engaging with the kingdom of God. Kingdom of God is not heaven where you go after you die. Yes, you do go to heaven. 
kingdom of God is right here and now, and it's a constant process. That's what missions is all about. So if you kind of retool your thought process in that. So um, historically, we've said go into all the world. What's the magic verse? Matthew. Come on, people, feedback. 28, 18 to 20. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, right? So when you have a missions conference, that's what you're supposed to speak on, right? Before Jesus ever sent his disciples around the world, you know what he told them to do? Come and see. And that's what we're going to look at today because I tell you, when you say go into all the world, it's one thing to go visit for a week with a team. It's another thing to say you get to go to this country by yourself and you get to learn that language and you get to uh, eat that food forever and you get to give the gospel to those people that you don't know the language so you get to learn the language and you can't learn barely learn English and you say I'm not going there I'm not eating that food I'm not I'm not doing that I'll go on a trip maybe for a week but I'm not going to live there because it's that's for the professionals that's the people that go through world partners but what if I said come and see See, in linguistics or in English language, there's supplied and non-supplied. So come and see implies that come with who? Come with me and see what I have seen. So I've already been there. So when Jesus says come and see, when people say come and see, it's a lot safer. It changes the whole dynamics. He says, you know what? I've already been there, and I will walk with you, and you can see what I've seen. Missions takes a whole new, another focus when you say come and see. And that's what Jesus started out with before he said go. And so we're going to talk about that today because today, COVID has changed our whole focus on missions to say come and see. Come to your Jerusalem and see what God is doing. Do you think he's working here? Do you think he has been working? Well, I want you to look with me in John chapter 1. This is a very familiar passage. I'm going to read it to you. If you have your cell phone apps or your your uh, hardback Bible there, um, starting with verse 35. I'm going to read it down through the end of the chapter. The next day, John the Baptist was there again with two of his disciples, and he saw Jesus passing by, and he said, Look, the Lamb of God. When the two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus, and turning around, Jesus saw them following and says, What do you want? They said, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? Come, he replied and you will see. So they went and saw where he was staying, spent that day with him, and it was about the 10th hour. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who heard what John had said and who had followed Jesus. The first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and tell him, we found the Messiah, that is the Christ, the sent one. Then he brought Simon to Jesus, who looked at him and said, you are Simon, son of John, you will be called Cephas, which is translated Peter, the rock. The next day, Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. Finding Philip, he said, follow me. Philip, like Andrew and Peter, from the was from the town of Bethsaida. Philip found Nathanael and told him, we found the one Moses wrote about in the law, and whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, son of Joseph. Nazareth, can anything come from there? Nathanael asked. Well, come and see, said Philip. When Jesus saw Nathanael approaching, he said of him, Waha, here is a true Israelite in whom there is nothing false. How do you know me, Nathanael asked. Jesus answered, I saw you while you were still under the fig tree before Philip called you. Nathanael declared, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Jesus said, you believe because I told you I saw you under the fig tree? You shall see greater things than that. He then added, I tell you the truth. You shall see heaven open." and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. John the Baptist starts out by identifying who Jesus is. This is the Messiah. This is the King. This is the guy we've been waiting for. You know, when Jesus comes into the picture, he wants, if you're taking notes, this is your first point, he wants to show his glory. He wants you to know he's around. He wants you to pay attention, though. Remember the child. He has, you have to be in tune with his spirit. Jesus is not saying, I'm hiding from everybody. I don't want anybody to know what's going on. He wants to reveal his glory. And John the Baptist said, this is the Lamb of God. This is the guy we've been waiting for. And Jesus brings it right to them. He says, what do you guys want? He says, Rabbi, where are you staying? 
What do you say? Come and see. And they spent the rest of the day with him, at his feet, listening to him. We don't know what they said, but what he said, but something went on for that whole day. Wouldn't it be cool to sit at Jesus' feet for a whole day? He explained everything <clears throat> about the Messiah and the coming and what he's going to do. By the time they were done with that day, Andrew was totally convinced. So convinced, he ran off and found his brother Peter and said, Peter, well, Simon, come, come. We found the real deal. We found the Messiah. This is the guy. You see, if you want to know what Jesus is doing, you have to sit at his feet before you start anything. You have to know his word. You have to listen to the Holy Spirit. Be in prayer. Not charging around in our own vision. And he said, come. Come with me. I've seen it. Come, Simon, and see. And you know what Simon did? He believed his brother, and he followed. And when he got to Jesus, you know what Jesus did? The very first thing he said to him, he said, you are Simon, but I'm going to call you Peter, the rock. You see, when Jesus enters the picture, and when we join with him, you know what he does? For every single one of us, he gives us a new identity, a new name. That's what your name is, right? You like it when people forget your name? How many of you have a name? Well, a few of you do. The rest of you are sleeping. How many of you have a name? How many of you like it when people remember your name? How many of you like it when somebody forgets your name? If you all go out on a date and you forget the girl's name, you've got a problem. Because your name is your identity. Jesus said, Peter, you're the rock, and I know what you're going to become. I have a plan for you, and I will give you a new identity, and I will make something in my kingdom with you if you will follow me, if you will come and see. You know, in Ephesians 2.10, it says, we are God, this is good King James again. I learned all my verses in King James, so I can't remember. the. We are God's workmanship, what? created in Christ Jesus to do good works which he predestined or prepared in advance for us to do. Before the world was even made, God had lined up what you and I are supposed to do. And he made you uniquely for that. You have certain characteristics, abilities, talents, skills, personalities, relationships that nobody else has. And if you think, oh, I have no place, that's a lie of the devil. God made you and prepared you specifically for a ministry, for part of his kingdom, for missions that nobody else can do but you. Now, will you engage in embracing that? And that's what he told Peter. He said, Peter, you're the rock, and I know what I have for you. I know he was going to build three little temples up there on top of the mountain. But Jesus wasn't done with him there yet. He knew what he was going to become, see. And sometimes you think, well, God, I don't know what you can do with me. Just hang on. God has a place for you. And that's what he wants Peter to know. That's what he wants us to know. You know, these guys that saw Jesus, Andrew, Peter, and later you'll see Philip, they were people of peace. Jesus is always looking for people of peace. And throughout the Bible, throughout the whole New Testament, always they were looking for somebody that was a person of peace. And there's four or five characteristics of a person of peace. It's basically an acronym of horse. You're hungry spiritually. The Holy Spirit brings this hunger through people, events, circumstances. You're open relationally. They're open to us to the story of who Jesus is, responsive to discipleship, ready to discover. They're like that child, ready to suck up information, truth, knowledge, share in community, ready to share with other people. They're not an island, an isolated person. And lastly, emerging in leadership. They want to grow. They want to stretch. They want God to do something in their life. I'm not satisfied with where I'm at. And these young millennials that entered our world were not satisfied with where they were at. And I want to tell you a little bit more about that here shortly. Okay, verse 43. What did Nathaniel or Peter, uh, Philip do? 
Well, Jesus said, Philip, come. Follow me. Come and see. We're going to Galilee. He didn't say, Philip, you go to Galilee ahead of me. Later he did that. But he said, we're going to Galilee. So come follow me. So what did Philip do? He runs off and gets his best bud, Nathaniel. Now, Nathaniel was a traditional fellow. He was a great man, solid. He knew his Bible. He knew prophecy. He knew that the Messiah did not come from Nazareth. And he says, you do not pull the wool over my eyes. He says, this is not the way God works. And so when Philip says, oh, no, no, we found the Messiah. I know he's the real deal. He said, "Uh uh-uh. He said, I know my Bible. I've been reading it. I've been studying it. He said, that's not how it works. He's the kind of guy that would be on your bylaws committee. You see, he was the obedient one. He does the tradition. He's the one that's wearing the mask. He was sitting under that fig tree, social distancing and wearing his mask, you know, when Philip ran up and found him. Now, I really don't know what he was doing, actually. But he was a man that Jesus said, there's no guile in you. There's nothing false in you. You are the structure. You are the traditionalist. You are the one that's holding on to those good things. But see, Jesus moves counterculture. And he said, I'm going to turn you on your ear. He says, I'm going to turn you upside down, and I'm going to show you that when the king enters the picture, things change. And I just entered the picture. And he said, I saw you under the fig tree. And he says, oh, Oh, I saw a miracle. Jesus, you knew? How did you know that? You must be the Messiah. He says, you know what, Nathaniel? If you will stick with me, and if you and I will stick with what Jesus is doing, you know what he said? Heavens will open, and the Father will unleash his angel and his glory on the Son of Man like you've never seen before. And that's what happened. There'll be an outpouring on ministry and missions that'll knock your socks off. I, Harrigan's addition there a little bit. If you will stick with me, Jesus said, Nathaniel, you'll see heavens open. And I believe that's what God wants for us today. If we will stick with him, the world's turned upside down. COVID's changed everything. Nobody's going to church. Nobody's doing this. Nobody's giving their money. Nobody cares about missions. Nobody can travel. You know what? He said, hang on. He said, hang on. He said, come and see. And I'm already working. Because see, Jesus was not sleeping this last year at all. My wife and I have been praying uh, for partners in ministry. You know, we uh, have outreach to Burmese and Somalis and Sudanese and... uh, I hope they're not watching today. If they are, I hope they come to Jesus. But we don't have a whole lot of partners saying, we're sticking with you. Because we're used to short-term mission trips. But this is our mission field. You know, how many of you go to Fort Wayne and go shopping? You only shop in Woodburn? Only three people go to Fort Wayne to go shopping. I'm amazed. You must go to Paulding, Ohio. I'm just trying to wake you people up here, okay? You ever saw anything different when you go to Fort Wayne? People wearing different clothes, wearing skirts, guys wearing skirts. Girls wearing, you know, they're kind of painted differently. They have turbans on. Well, go to Walmart. The houses in the south side now, the bricks are painted orange. And the color spectrum does not fit anything you would ever paint on the outside of your house. Things are changing in our world. And you go at the right time, you'll see partying. A month ago, there was Ramadan. The world is changing. It's coming here. It is here. It's here by the thousands. Maybe even tens of thousands. What are we doing about that? Does God see that? Well, we started praying for millennials. And a young guy came in the midst of COVID last year, year over a year ago. And you know, he graduated from Woodland High School. He's from Woodburn area. Actually, his, his grandparents were Amish. His name's Caden. And he said, I'm sick and tired of sitting around. I want to do something. He was an ESL teacher with some of these Burmese kids in the schools. And he started calling his friends, girls with names like Steiner, related to the missionary church, kids that were missionary kids, kids that teachers who were all day long with some of these kids 
but said, we love these kids, but nobody's telling them about Jesus. We need to get connected with them. We want to do something. God opened up a group of probably 20 young adults from all churches. We got at least 10 different denominations. I'm talking different churches, charismatic and down to just, you know, house churches of all walks of life, said, calling each other, say, come and see, come and see, come and see. And down in the inner city, down on the south side of Fort Wayne, we have an apartment called Autumn Woods. We have a, a legal center there where once a week we help people with citizenship, green cards. We meet all kinds of people, all kinds of Burmese, all kinds of connections. That's open doors for people to connect with people that they never would have seen, never would have touched. We've had young people come with youth groups coming. COVID kind of put an end to that. We had one group come last year. But we started up a kids club on Friday for these kids. Because you know why we do Friday? Friday's the Muslim Sunday. So while mom and dad are in church, they shoo the kids out. The kids have nothing to do. So while the cat's away, the mice will play. So I said, that's our day. We're going to go and have our kids club. So after school, normally every day of the week, these kids have to go and study Arabic and Islamic school. Every day, but one day. That's Friday. So we started a kids club, and we have 40, 50 kids come out. And of course, I don't have pictures to show. You have to go outside and look on your screen out there. And you know what? We started talking, teaching these young adults how to engage in spiritual conversation. Because it's not just about playing. It's how do you bring Jesus into play? You know who are the ones that are going to respond? The ones who can hear and understand English. Well, who are those? It's the kids. Because mom and dad, their English is kind of rough, and my Burmese is like zero. I can say hi, bye. Because, you know, older people don't learn their languages very good anymore, right? So we're working on it. Well, a couple young boys came and said, we're interested in spiritual stuff. They started to read the Bible. So we started a boys' club on Tuesday, just for an hour in there, right? It's as soon as they got off of school and before Islamic school started. and started watching video, Superbook. Opened his kid's Bible. It was just a couple boys. A couple boys prayed, said, we want to clean our hearts up. We want Jesus cleared the temple. I want him to clean my heart. So I didn't say you're a Christian now. I just said, yeah, that's good. Let's ask Jesus to pray and clean your heart out. Let's ask the Holy Spirit to come in. He says, okay, I want to pray and ask the Holy Spirit to come in. I wonder what that is. I think that's pretty, pretty important, isn't it? That's inviting Jesus into the situation. And that's the journey. And the girls said, well, we want a girls club. So some of these teachers, after school, after being all day with these kids in school, said, we're going to come and do a girls club. That's commitment. That's energy. More than I have. God is at work raising up young people, young adults who said, we want to serve. We are committed. And they're calling their friends to do what? Come and see. We have so many. I have no clue who these people are. Come. Come. They say, can I invite my friend? Sure. Come on down. Come and see what God is doing. You see, that whole thing of being a person of peace, am I that person of peace? Are you that person of peace? And these are the things where we begin to say, well, how do we continue to engage? You see, it kind of takes the mystic out of missions. Can I go fishing? Yesterday, we took some Burmese, those two Burmese boys that prayed to receive Christ, took them fishing. Never fished in their life. The one has a dad who's got throat cancer. Can't drive, would never, ever take him anywhere. The other one comes from a divorced family. What opens their heart? What makes them respond to love? It's just a relationship. Skateboarding. I do not skateboard, but I know about skateboarding. So I got a whole bunch of skateboards from one church, and these kids are skating all over the streets. Yep, no helmets, no pads. Sorry, Mom. Sorry, my wife's a nurse. You know what? Rules are for out here in suburbia. Down there, there are very few rules, and we just pray a lot. You know what? God has protected us. We have not had one case. We have done interaction, face-to-face -face ministry, outdoors and indoors, all year long. We have not had one COVID. 
case from our center. We've had COVID outside, so we've said, oh, we've got to stop for a week. We've got to change. You can't come. Now, does God want to do something? I believe he does. And you may say, well, maybe, maybe you're like Peter. You say, I don't know where my identity is. Come sit at Jesus' feet. Come spend time with him first. Say, pray, Jesus, show me. Show my church. You're looking for a pastor, but more than that, say, what are we as a church? It's not too far away. One of your woodland kids is one of the main leaders there. Fort Wayne is not far away, folks. What is your identity? What is your unique calling that God wired you for? What do you love to do? Maybe you're a traditionalist. You say, well, uh, God doesn't work that way. Missions is not that way. Church is not that way. That's not how we've done things before. Jesus will turn all of us on our ears at some point in our life so we will pay attention, so we will listen, so we will come and see. Are you a person of peace? Are you relational? Are you willing to learn as a child and say, I want to, I want to, I want to change. I want to suck. I want to be, this is the season. I heard your song. This is the season. The wind's blowing. Is that true? He said, if you'll hang with me, like Nathaniel, you'll see the heavens open and the floodgates of heaven and the angels coming and going. He said, you will see stuff you've never seen before. Right next door. Yeah, there's international cross-cultural missions, but you know what? Jesus said, to start with, come and see. And we're inviting you today. Bring your mask, put them on. We have a mission, actually two, two churches. One just came last night. For the next two weeks, we have stuff going on down there in the inner city. Next two weeks with the Burmese kids, with the Muslim kids. One church is from Angola, missionary church. One is from Minnesota. They're driving in. They were here two years ago, and they brought two little girls to Jesus, and that's why we started the kids' club. See, God will take anything we do if we give it to him to bring glory to his name. Tom, would you come up and close us today? Our missionaries, as they come and recount the goodness of, uh, of our Lord and the grace that he extends. We're going to do another calisthenics here, another show of hands. Um, how many are in awe of, of, of our missionaries? I know I am. I, I, get, I can get choked up very easily talking about them. Um, As far as preaching the gospel, some people uh, they may say I'm trivial, but I like trivia. Um, biblically, there are over 100 references to the gospel in the scripture, both in Old and New Testament. If you doubt me, I looked it up on Google. All you have to do is get your phone out. It's there. It's on the internet. It's true. The whole, um, the whole idea of going into the whole world and preaching the gospel is it's compelling, but it's more than compelling, it's a command. And I think that's the least we can do uh, for our Lord and Savior. I need to re kind of uh, recount a little story, and, and Steve hit on this a little bit. Uh, several years ago, when we were taking teams to Costa Rica um, on one of the last trips there, I was talking to Steve Gilroy, our, our friend down there, Steve and Elizabeth, and he was, we were in a Nicaraguan barrio. You guys know what a barrio is. It's like a, it's a slum. Costa Rica puts their um, immigrants in these specific areas, a little bit like the way our government does, and then they keep them there. But he was standing there kind of looking at these kids as they were coming up the street to a, a 
a VBS that we were putting on. And I said, what are you looking at, Steve? He said, this, the fields are ripe to harvest. Well, they are ripe to harvest, aren't they? So, if you feel the Lord, and I think there probably are some people out here, if you feel the Lord nudging you, now's the time to do it. It's a good time to do it. The Harrigans are going to be um, out there in the, in the lobby between services and after the second service. Now's the time to take that next step. Uh, be obedient is the biggest thing. Just be obedient and answer, answer the Lord's uh, call. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are in awe of your majesty and your glory and your grace and how you've extended that to us. And we thank you for that. We're thankful, Lord, that when you asked who would go to the nations, there were people like Stephen and Sheila that said, here we are, Lord, send us. And I pray that our prayer, or my prayer, is that uh, we never miss an opportunity or turn down an opportunity to spread the gospel. Go with us this week in Jesus' name. Amen. You're dismissed.